All right, good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started. So for announcements, uh, Lab 10 will be held this week. So this will be the first of two sessions for Lab 10. It's probably going to take you longer than just one session to finish Lab 10 and do your demonstration. So that's why there are two sessions. Um, there is no pre-lab, but I recommend reviewing that lab and, and uh, starting your design so that you walk into lab knowing uh, what you want to build. So take a look at that. That is on the uh, course website on Canvas. And then my office hours will be right after class today if you have any questions. So I wanted to start today out with a preview of, of the lab. So we've covered a lot in this class. We started out with basic circuit theory. We went through um, uh, AC analysis. We went through uh, capacitors and inductors, and we talked about um, different uh, electronics like uh, semiconductors, diodes, and LEDs, and uh, transistors. So you're going to wrap all that together in this lab uh, entitled Electronics Applications. What you're going to do is primarily this is going to be an infrared remote control tester. So uh, many of your infrared remote controls or many of your remote controls, I should say, that might look like this. You know, if you look at the front, there's a what looks like a clear LED. That's actually an infrared LED. OK, you can't see it because you can't see IR. But um, so it emits pulses of infrared light when you press a button. So you should be able to build a detector that senses that. And you could also use this application for an IR sensor for a security system. If you wanted to detect an infrared beam or an infrared light or reflection of an infrared light, you could use this for that too, or, or an obstacle sensor or an RPM sensor. There's lots of applications for, for this kind of circuit. You're going to build an inf infrared emitter circuit, which is going to be an LED circuit and an infrared detector circuit, which is a phototransistor. And so it behaves like a transistor, except the instead of base current causing collector current to flow, infrared light impinging on its window causes collector current to flow. You're going to build a comparator circuit. Um, and this is primarily going to be your design with some guidance. So everybody might have a different uh, different values in their circuit. But I'll give you guidance. The TAs will give you guidance. We'll show you block diagrams and we'll show you sample circuits. Okay, so you now have all the circuits knowledge you need to create your own design for this. So we've covered enough in this class to implement this application. You're going to use an infrared emitter LED. And so that's what this is. It looks like just a regular LED, but when you apply current through this LED, you won't see any light emitted like you would with a red, green, white LED. Um, but you can treat it just like a regular LED in terms of biasing it with a forward current that you want. You're going to use an infrared phototransistor. So here's the schematic symbol for that phototransistor, except instead of a base shown here, um, it shows two arrows indicating light um, impinging on this. So that light intensity controls the collector current. Okay, and then you're going to use a specialized comparator integrated circuit like we talked about uh, in class. So you'll have to use a pull-up resistor for this circuit, just like we talked about during the op-amp section of class. The block diagram looks like this. So you're going to have uh, some kind of infrared source. I'm going to ask you to bring um, a remote control to the lab. So any remote control that has the, you know, look at the front, if it has what looks like a clear LED, it will work. You're going to build a small infrared emitter circuit for testing. Okay, just before you have your uh, remote control pointed at this device, you're going to build an infrared detector and that infrared detector is going to output a signal um, that it varies with the intensity of the infrared light hitting it. And so you're going to, get, going to have two comparators, comparator one and comparator two. Comparator one is going to go high as its output when infrared light is present and it will light up a red LED. Comparator two uh, is going to indicate the absence of light. So it's going to light up an LED um, when there's no light. So 
one of these two lights should be on all the time. Either IR light is present or IR light isn't present. Um, and then you're going to have a, a green LED that shows that your circuit is powered. Okay, and then when you when you point a uh, remote control at your infrared detector, what you should see are these lights flashing because the uh, the IR remote control is emitting pulses of light. Okay, so uh, there's no pre lab, but I do recommend that you essentially do a pre lab. Take a look at the the lab, read through the lab, so that you can get this lab done in the two lab periods. Uh, you you will need to bring an IR remote control for the final test of your circuit. So um, if you can, uh, you know, you might get your circuit ready to test this Friday. So I recommend bringing in an IR remote control and then uh, but plan on the last lab, which is next Friday, not this Friday. Uh, that's where you will demonstrate this to your TA and show that your your tester is working. So if you have any questions about this, stop by office hours right after class and we can chat about it. All right. Okay. Um, we started talking about microcontrollers last time at the end of the last lecture. And for this lecture, I wanted to start out the real material connecting logic gates and transistors to math operations performed by microcontrollers. So you could see how, well, wait a minute, we studied semiconductors and transistors and binary values, and how do you make a computer add numbers together. So let me let me let me make that connection for you here. Let's see. Okay. So what I want to do is take you first from uh, transistors to gates, and then I'll take you from gates to math operations, because then you could see well how do you make transistors do math operations. Okay, so we're going to do this in two steps. Let's start out with a uh, an OR gate. Let's see how to implement an OR gate with transistors. So <clears throat> right here, this, this would act, this would function as an OR gate, these two transistors connected as shown. So the, uh, so imagine you have something like a six volt power supply, that dot should be connected right there, but you have a six volt power supply so six volts and ground, and you have two transistors. A and B are the inputs to this OR gate. And you have this transistor that has a base resistor connected to it. And, and so suppose that the beta of these transistors is such that if you apply a logic level signal like five volts or six volts to, to an input, that that transistor would be saturated, right? So VCE would fall to 0.2 volts or below. And so that's if you apply a, a high value, a one to an input. And if you apply a low value to an input, zero volts, then the transistor would be in cutoff. So no current would flow into the collector. Okay, so then what you would have here is, uh, for example, if you apply a one to A and a zero to B, then A would be a saturated transistor. So current would flow, right? You'd have 0.2 volts or less collector to emitter, and that would essentially connect that six volt source to the output, and then the current would flow, the collector current would flow down through the resistor to ground. So if A is one, then the output is one, okay? If you make A zero and B one, then this transistor at the bottom would be saturated, and you'd connect the six volt source again to the output through the other transistor. So when B is one, the output would be one. So far so good for an OR gate. If you have both inputs as ones, right, let's say five or six volts here in this case, both transistors would be saturated. So you're connect you have two paths connecting that six volt power supply down to the output and the output would be one. And then to make the output a zero, you'd have to have both inputs as zeros or zero volts. Okay, so that, that's how you could create an OR gate using transistors from the knowledge from earlier in this class. An AND gate would look like this. So here you have uh, the current going through into cascaded transistors like this. So uh, the only way you'd get an output equal to one here is if both of these transistors were saturated, right? If only one is saturated and the other is in cutoff, 
then there's a broken connection between the output and the power supply voltage. But if you have both saturated, then there's a connection through both transistors to the output. And uh, this would be an AND gate. So you'd have to have both A and B equal to one to get a one at the output. Okay, so, so this gives you an idea of how you can use transistors to create AND gates and OR gates. And I'll show you an inverter in a bit. We'll actually do a clicker for that. Okay, so this takes, takes you, this gives you a couple examples of going from transistors to gates. Okay, now let's go from gates to math operations. Okay, so now that you can build gates out of transistors, how do you add numbers? How do you add binary numbers? Let's start off with what's called a half adder. It performs an addition of two bits, okay? So let's suppose you have two bits, A and B, and you want to add A plus B. Okay, not just an OR gate, you want to actually do an arithmetic add of A plus B. And you want the output to be a sum, so that's this S. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So if I have A0 and B0, this is an exclusive OR gate. So A0 and B0, you'll get a sum of zero. That's right, right out of the exclusive OR gate. Look at the S bit. Forget about the carry for now, the C bit. If you have A equal to one and B equal to zero, then you get a one, right? One plus zero is one, that makes sense. If I have uh, A, A equal to, let's see, zero and B equal to one, then zero plus one is one, right? Okay, so I've handled three of the four cases of adding two, uh, these two bits together. But what if I have A equal to one and B equal to one? The output of that exclusive OR is going to be um, a zero, right? So, so that zero is, uh, that's weird, one plus one is zero. Well, you're, you're actually adding one bit and then you have a, um, a carry bit here. So one plus one is zero, carry the one, and then that one carries over to the summation into the next bits column. So one plus one is two, and that's a binary one zero. Okay, so this half adder adds two bits and then it passes the carry bit to the next stage of adder. And we'll talk about that in a second. But but this carrying of a value is just like we do in decimal addition, right? If you have six plus seven, decimal, six plus seven is thirteen. We write a three and we carry the one, right? So that's where that that's how that one is handled in the next digit over. Okay, so what do you do with that carry bit and the remainder of the bits in a word? Well, then you use a full adder, and a full adder looks like this. A full adder has inputs of A and B, so they're the next digit of addition. And then the carry input from the previous um, half adder or adder, where you have a uh, carry from that other adder into this one. So this is a little more complicated. You have a couple XOR gates, a couple AND gates, and, a, and an OR gate here. And you, you still have a sum output and a carry out. Right, so here's the table that describes inputs and outputs. This is a truth table for a full adder. Uh, you know, one, uh, zero plus zero is zero, and zero plus zero is, well, one if the carry bit input is one. Okay, so you can follow that all the way down. And you could stack these up, like start with a half adder and the rightmost bit, and then use full adders for each subsequent to the left uh, bit. And you can add binary numbers with. Uh, with these gates. Now, when I described the XOR gate, when we talked about gates, I said that's uh, that's a modulo two addition, right? Modulo. This is a modulo two add. One plus one is zero. That's a modulo two addition. So that's what the XOR gives you. Um, a regular OR gate would not give you that. A regular OR gate is one plus one is one. So you use this exclusive OR. This um, modulo two addition to sum bits together and produce an output. Okay, but I've taken you from transistors to gates and now gates to mathematical operations. So now you can imagine in your mind, how would you go from 
transistors to math operations, right? This is how it's done. This is how you can use transistors and binary numbers and either cut off or saturated transistors to perform addition of binary numbers really fast. It depends on the, the reaction speed of those um, uh, transistors and the, the propagation speed through the circuit. All right. So, um, and you can see building higher and higher levels of operation based on transistors for this and, and other functions. Okay, so uh, let's do let's do a clicker. Try to figure out what this um, circuit is doing here. So you have a single transistor in a circuit. You have an input here on the left, right? There's one input here, and there's one output, and there's a power supply. So you know how the power supplies or the integrated circuits with logic chips had power supply pins. These terminals, this terminal at the top, this terminal at the bottom, that would connect to the power supply pin, pins. Okay, so, so which logic gate is implemented here with this circuit? You know, think about if you apply a one to the input, what happens to that transistor? And then what's the output? And then the opposite. If you apply zero, what happens to that transistor? All right, take uh, 10 more seconds. Take a guess if you haven't answered already. All right. Okay. So, um, so a first clue here is that this logic gate implemented here has one input. Okay. So an OR gate has two inputs, or this OR gate has two inputs, A plus B. So there is no B. So it can't be that. And an AND gate has two inputs. So it can't be that. So you should cross those out right away. A and C are not possible because we don't have two inputs here. Okay. Um, so it's either a buffer or an inverter. So let's take a look. If we apply zero volts to the input, what happens at the output? Well, if I apply zero volts to the input, that transistor is in cutoff, right? There's no base current, so there's no collector current. So there's no current flowing through this 10K ohm resistor. If there's no current flowing through that 10K ohm resistor, by Ohm's law, we have zero volts across that 10K ohm resistor. So that means there's zero volts difference between the output and five volts. The output would be five volts. Okay, so a zero becomes a one. What if we apply five volts? If we apply five volts, logic level one, that would saturate this transistor. So we'd have 0.2 volts or below uh, from collector to emitter here. So it'd be approximately zero volts node voltage at the output. So a zero becomes a one, a one becomes a zero. This is a logic inverter. All right. All right, any questions on that, on that problem? All right, nothing seen in the chat, nothing heard. So we'll continue. Okay. So let's continue on with talking about microcontrollers. So stepping back for a comparison and a contrast to logic, discrete logic integrated circuits. So um, let's see here, look at my arrow. 
So combinatorial logic gates, like NAND, like an inverter, like um, they they take an input and they give you an immediate output. So the output is dependent dependent on the present, the current time inputs. There's also another kind of logic called sequential logic, and we're not going to talk in detail about that. But sequential logic is something like a counter. So a counter has memory, right? It, it's a current count or it's next count. Like let's suppose it counts pulses. So you have a pulse and the counter increments from two to three and three to four and four to five. The counter has to have memory. So the counter not only depends on present inputs, but past inputs. Okay, so that's called sequential logic. And each IC performs a specific logical operation for combinatorial and sequential logic. And functions are created by wiring the IC pins together, like on a breadboard or a circuit board. And if you need a different type of function, or if you run out of gates, you have to add another IC. Okay, so the advantages are combinatorial logic gates are inexpensive and simple to use for just a few logic gates and a simple logic circuit. Okay, but they're not um, easily programmable and they have fairly large packaging if you have a complex, let's say, program you're trying to write or, or logic you're trying to implement. Okay, so there's advantages and disadvantages of logic integrated circuits compared to microcontrollers. Okay, but but they have their place. They're still used. They have their place. They're very fast. You can you can get outputs in um, you know very very short time periods, like on the order of nanoseconds versus maybe milliseconds for uh, some of the slower microcontrollers. All right, and so let's compare those two microcontrollers and microprocessors. Okay, let's let's look at its uh, those per. The, the purpose of microcontrollers and some applications. So microcontroller is an integrated circuit and it's typically used in applications where you have to sense a value like pressure, like temperature, like light, you have to sense a value and or, or measure a value um, and then control something like an actuator, like a motor, like a, you know, uh, some kind of heater or something, maybe some, something that's controlling a physical system. Um, so let's contrast a microcontroller to a microprocessor. A microprocessor isn't normally used to sense, measure, and control. Um, it's usually used to crunch numbers, to process data very fast, perform calculations very fast. So, so that's one differentiation of microcontroller versus microprocessor. There, there is crossover here. Microcontrollers used to be really slow. Microcontrollers used to be relatively really fast. Um, microcontrollers got faster. There's some slow microprocessors available, and there's some microprocessors with uh, some um, sensor ports, and uh, analog to digital ports, and uh, ways you could output signals too, output analog signals. So it's so sort of a Venn diagram. There is some crossover here. But generally, you use microcontrollers for sensing and controlling, and that's why we cover this in, cover microcontrollers in a mechanical engineering class because I think that's more relevant. Okay, microcontrollers generally have more peripherals than microprocessors, and these peripherals are meant to support sensing and control, and they're generally slower. Microcontrollers are generally slower, um, but both microcontrollers and microprocessors have software-definable logic functions and se sequential functions and branching functions, communications functions, for example. And what you usually do is you use a, a PC to create software, which you compile and then download those compiled instructions down to the microcontroller memory. Okay, and microcontrollers have many capabilities. So the if you've ever used an Arduino, if you get the data sheet for the microcontroller, the actual chip, uh, it has 294 pages, right? You've, you've been looking at data sheets in our lab. They have, you know, two, three, four, five pages, something like that. Well, that microcontroller, on the Arduino board is uh, on one of the Arduino boards is 294 pages, and that's one of the shorter ones, actually. Okay, and microcontrollers come in many packages, many different physical sizes. Here's a big dual inline pin, a DIP package, 
uh, microcontroller. Here's a surface mount package. Here's another surface mount package. You can get really small microcontrollers. You can get an eight pin microcontroller. Um, so they have various numbers of uh, interface pins to use. Depends on what you need. Okay, so a popular uh, microcontroller for hobbyists and experimenters and for rapid development in professional projects is, is the Arduino. It's becoming, it has become very popular for quick prototyping. So when you hear Arduino, um, I will call it a microcontroller, but the Arduino is really a board with a microcontroller on it and the whole development environment. So an Arduino is really a family of development boards. So there's the Arduino Uno, there's the Arduino, Arduino like Mega, different ones. Um, and they use uh, Atmel microcontrollers. Microchip bought Atmel. And so uh, uh, Microchip now makes the microcontrollers for Arduino. And, and I think they've branched out into other manufacturers too of of microcontrollers. So, but an Arduino is a board and a development environment. And strictly speaking, the microcontroller is the chip on the board. So a question from anyone? I thought I heard something. Okay, let's see here. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, Arduinos have become really popular because there's a huge uh, support system, huge community of users. Um, hobbyists are using Arduinos, professionals are using Arduinos uh, to prototype. And there's a correspondingly large amount of support just on the web to answer any question you have. So comparing microcontrollers versus logic gates is what I wanted to get to here. Um, there are advantages of microcontrollers. They're inexpensive to implement, to use to implement numerous functions. So you could have thousands of logic gates doing different things, and you could have sequential logic, and you can have branching functions. You can run loops, things like that. That would be very difficult to do with uh, discrete logic gates. They're reprogrammable. Um, and they handle sequential programming in a small package. The disadvantages are, well, if you need just a small logic function, um, then you have to start up a development environment and uh, it's a bit overkill. So you're, you're using a PC with software to write a program to download and it's a bit overkill just for um, a few combinatorial logic functions built into some application. And microcontrollers, even though they're pretty fast, they're slow compared to high-speed logic gates. Okay, so again, instead of nanoseconds or microseconds, uh, you might take milliseconds or tenths of seconds to get something done with a microcontroller. All right, someone asks, is a CPU a microcontroller? Um, a microcontroller has a CPU in it. CPU is an overloaded term, meaning it's it's used for to mean different things to different people. In a microcontroller, the CPU, and I'll show you this, is like the 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 heart of the microcontroller. It 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 is the thing that goes and gets values from memory and performs mathematical operations and outputs values to ports and things like that. That's the CPU. That's a part of that's a it's a section of a microcontroller. Some people use the term CPU to mean the box that your PC is in. Like you have a CPU and a monitor and a keyboard, right? So that's some people use that. But but in the microcontroller world, uh, the CPU is a uh, is a function within. It's a piece within the microcontroller. Okay. And so uh, a microcontroller is typically part of an embedded system. So you'll hear people like, like embedded system engineers, or it's an embedded system. It's usually uh, a sensing and controlling system or software written for something that is not a PC. So an embedded system has a controller. That controller might be a microcontroller or a microprocessor. Um, and it has hardware and software. And all of that forms a component of some larger mechanical and electrical system. 
And usually these are meant to function without the need for human intervention, except for maybe a user interface. Okay, so embedded systems are electronic systems that are built into electronic and mechanical systems to do something, um, to usually sense and control. The processor of an embedded system supports, supports the operation of the product. It's not the point of the product. Right? The point of your PC is to crunch numbers, whether it's for PowerPoint or for games or for crunching Excel data or MATLAB or whatever, your CAD software, right? That's the point of the PC is to do the processing and give me some display interface. Um, usually uh, an embedded system is uh, like the uh, microcontroller is not the point of your refrigerator. You don't care that your refrigerator has a microcontroller. You don't care how much memory it has. You don't, you don't, you don't care what's, you know, what speed it's running. You just care that your food stays cold. The light comes on when you open the door and right, whatever. It doesn't make much noise, but that's a different story. So, so the point of the processor or the point of the application um, or the point of the pro is not the, it, it, like if you have a, an embedded system, that's not the point, right? You, you don't really care usually about the processor. For a PC, you do care about the processor because more memory, more speed means, you know, your, your CAD model runs more smoothly um, and you can do analysis more quickly. Um, products that have sense and control functions, like appliances, different things, probably have either a microcontroller or otherwise microcontroller functionality, like an application-specific integrated circuit, and sometimes FPGAs, but field programmable gate, away, uh, gate arrays. But, but usually, uh, oftentimes, these, these products that sense and control like a thermostat or a refrigerator or even a washing machine, they have some kind of microcontroller functionality that could be software controlled. Anything that can be updated either has um, uh, software or firmware and this kind of microcontroller functionality. So appliances, there's automotive application like ABS brakes and engine controllers, aircraft instrumentation and autopilots, things like that. And many industrial applications um, have some kind of sensing and control, and there's probably some kind of software running on a microcontroller. Microcontrollers span a wide range of functionality and cost. You can get big microcontrollers, uh, many pins or a few pins, lots of peripherals like communications peripherals, things like that. Um, they can cost a, a you know sub one dollar up to many dollars. So you. you get what you need and you get what you pay for. So contrast an embedded system to a personal computer, right? A personal computer, you download some software, you're primarily using a screen um, and a keyboard and a mouse for lots of human interface. Uh, an embed embedded system, you may or may not have a screen. You may just have a couple buttons. You may have no buttons, you know, very minimal human interface. So that's that's usually the distinction. If the point of the processor or, or if, the, uh, if the processor isn't the point of the system, it's probably an embedded system. Okay, let's look at an example application. So here's just a scale, but it's, a, it's, it's an application that calls out many of the reasons we use a microcontroller. So you have a weight, here's the scale. You want to put a weight on a scale and you want to see the weight over here in certain units. Okay, so that's that the, the application is that. Put a weight on something, show me the weight. Okay, so how do you do that, right? You're gonna have some kind of sensor. So you might have some kind of load cell or strain gauge here over on the left. If you want to learn a lot more about those, take my next class. We talk a lot about uh, load sensor, load cells and strain gauges and different sensors, but but they, they basically, um, re resistance changes, uh, uh, like in a strain gauge, if you bend a strain, or if you either, um, um, I'll say stretch, compress, um, stretch or compress a strain gauge, you'll change its resistance. You could put them in a bridge and you can use, uh, that will create a very small voltage difference. And then you can use an amplifier like an op-amp circuit to create a, uh, an output voltage that's measurable. Okay, 
And so here's the microcontroller. The microcontroller is running some software so that it can use an analog to digital converter to get a digital value, a binary value, that is proportional to that voltage from the sensor. Okay, sometimes, oftentimes, the analog to digital converter is built into the microcontroller as a peripheral. So usually it's, these days it's not separate. But that microcontroller is sitting there running a program sensing the value of that voltage, right? It's getting a digital value. It's it's waiting for you to input, uh, or not waiting. It's it's responding to your input of uh, do you want units of grams or units of ounces, and do you want to tear the scale? Do you want to uh, set the zero for the scale? And then it's sitting there every time it gets an update or periodically, it's outputting values to an LCD controller, liquid crystal display, and outputting that on this LCD. Okay, so, um, oops. So that's a good application. It, it you're sensing, right, and you're outputting a value to user interface, and you could actually control something with this too. That microcontroller could have outputs via ports that do something in response to to a weight. You know, maybe it's a, it's like a, a sensing the weight of someone walking onto a pad near a door, and it opens the door electronically, or something like that. Okay. So you can sense and control. Okay, Here, here's what's going on inside the microcontroller. And so this is just an overview, but many microcontrollers operate like this. Some There's various differences, but here's where the CPU comes into play. The CPU is the brain. It's the central processing unit. It performs math operations. It has an ALU, an arithmetic logic unit to do that. And it has registers for storage of uh, values, so it can access those values quickly, or it can it can check configurations um, using values using registers. Okay, and so here's how this works: the CPU is the brain, and then you have program memory. That's where your program is stored. So you write a program on your PC, you download it to the microcontroller. Uh, that's a set of instructions in program memory. The values that you store in variables are in data memory. Okay, so that's that's uh, RAM. So program memory is you turn the power off; it's non-volatile, meaning you turn the power off, and the program stays there until you when you turn it on again, the program runs. Runs. RAM is temporary memory, so you turn the power off. Oftentimes, the RAM goes away; the memory is gone. And so that's used for temporary storage of, for example, variables. And then there are inputs and output ports. So you can have um, digital output values. You can make five volts or zero volts happen on a pin. You can sense on a pin five volts or zero volts, right? And you get a digital value on the inside of the microcontroller to use. And then there are also um, peripherals that aren't shown here, but peripherals are things like um, communications peripherals like uh, uh, serial protocols you can run um, what are called um, uh, like like a spy bus serial peripheral interface what else analog to digital converters so this is a minimally functional microcontroller right here but the important parts are here so it would work like this you download your program into program memory and turn off your microcontroller. You turn it on. So when the microcontroller wakes up, the CPU says, <clears throat> give me my first instruction. Let's get first instruction. So it goes out to program memory over this data bus. The data bus is just basically parallel wires that go out and um, can be shared to exchange data between memory and the CPU and peripherals. OK, so the CPU goes out and, and gets program uh, gets a gets an instruction. Well, how is how does that happen, right? How does that how does this process all start? Well, there's a clock here, so a clock isn't like a time of day clock. It's a it's a square wave, and something happens usually either on the rising edge of the square wave or the falling edge of the square wave, or maybe both rising and falling edge. So the clock is synchronizing all the operations here. And that clock determines the speed at which the CPU will run. So you get your first clock cycle, maybe rising edge, and the CPU 
goes out and it gets its first instruction. And so the instruction is then presented by program memory on the, uh, the data bus and the CPU says, okay, I have my first instruction. Maybe it's add two numbers, right? So let's add two numbers. So the CPU after a few clock cycles says, oh, I have to go, I have to go get those numbers to add out of memory. <clears throat> so this data memory, maybe before earlier in the program, you put some values into, into memory here. It goes out and gets the first number and puts it in a register. It goes out and it gets the second number from data memory, puts it in a register. It performs an addition, right? That addition is performed just like I showed you, right? When I, with gates and with transistors, and then that output goes into a register and that CPU then puts that value back into data memory so your program can access it. Okay, so, so all this is going on um, synchronized with the clock and in this order. So you can then, let's say you want to control something at an output a port. You can program the CPU to make a, an output port pin be a value of one, right? A logical value of one, of one or maybe you know five volts, if it's five volt logic. So that can be all part of your program and your CPU is going into different addresses. That's what the address bus, bus is used for. An address is a location with memory where you want to either get or store a value um, from program memory or, or data memory. Okay, so that's just a really high level expl explanation of, of how this works, but, but the CPU is the brain, program memory stores program uh, data, data memory stores variables, things like that. And then you have access to the outside world using ports. And we'll talk about ports. Okay, so here is an example microcontroller development board. This is the Arduino Uno Rev3. So just to show you what's on here, here's the microcontroller right here. Okay, and there's lots of other stuff on this board. So this is the USB port for programming and the power interface when you don't have an alternate power input connected. Um, there's a voltage regulator here. We'll talk about that if we have time toward the end of the, the course. Um, let's see what else is here. So we have some capacitors to filter the power supply voltage. So remember I mentioned when you're connecting, when you're building a circuit with an op amp, right at the power pins, you usually put uh, capacitors. And you'll see that here. You'll see these little capacitors. There's a capacitor right there. There's a capacitor right there. They're right at the power pins to keep noise off of the filter noise out of the power supply lines. Here are two big, big capacitors for the input power to make sure that if you have noisy power, DC plus AC coming in, that you're trying to suppress, atten attenuate, filter out the AC because that will mess up your processing. Here is the source of the clock, or I should say a crystal that controls the clock frequency. So this particular board has a 16 megahertz clock. Um, so that is uh, a crystal. Crystal acts like a very narrow filter so that the, um, the electronics that are generating that 16 megahertz square wave that is the clock uh, stay precisely on frequency or very close to frequency. <clears throat> okay, and let's see, here's, here's the USB interface integrated circuit here. All right. What else is here? And then you access all of the pins from that microcontroller on this board through these headers. So these are header pins here, header sockets. All right. Okay, so, so we're going to talk about basically a, a survey of microcontrollers in this course. We're not going to be programming in detail or talking about a run, you know, how to how to use A to D converters and configure those and how those work. Again, if you want to, if you want to continue, that is offered next semester. But what I want to offer here is an overview so that you could pick up a microcontroller understand how it works. And if you want to, let's say you're building a senior project, you're doing grad school work or you're a mechanical engineer in industry and all you have to do is just do some 
basic control, basic sensing. You could do it yourself using what you learn in this class and maybe a couple hours on uh, on YouTube. So uh, microcontroller, let's talk about microcontroller ports and peripherals. Digital ports are the digital inputs and outputs. Okay, so those are actually pins of the microcontrollers. That's right here. So these right here on this board, these are the digital ports. And you can assign those ports to be inputs or outputs. You have to configure them. And those are logic signals, meaning zero or one, false or true, no or yes, right? In the real world with a voltmeter in your hand, those are either zero volts or three volts, um, either output or input for three volt logic or zero volts or five volts for five volt logic. Um, these digital ports can be used to trigger certain functions within the microcontroller. Those are called interrupts. Okay, so you can not only uh, um, control the voltage of those pins or read the voltage of those pins, um, I should logic voltage, I should say logic voltage of those pins, but you can also trigger internal things going on like timers inside the microcontroller using those digital ports. Uh, peripherals are special capabilities within the microcontroller. For example, analog to digital conversion, right? You wanna take an analog signal somewhere between zero volts and five volts maybe. And you wanna know, is it 3.36 volts, right? You wanna know what the voltage is, perform a measurement. There's digital to analog conversion. Um, digital to analog conversion sometimes is done on the microcontroller directly. So you can create an output analog voltage from a binary number in your program. And then there are uh, timers. So timers are used, for example, for generating pulse width modulated signals. When you were controlling the brightness of an LED, you were using PWM. And microcontrollers will do that using their internal timer peripherals pretty easily. You can also read input periods um, and you can produce output periods. So you can perform uh, timing. Let's suppose you're trying to time something that's going past two light detectors. Uh, you can do that using the timer peripherals in a microcontroller. All right, they have communications interfaces built in like the serial peripheral interface, SPI, I squared C, RS-232 serial, and uh, USB, although USB is usually, USB usually requires some kind of external um, peripheral trip, uh, peripheral IC to use. Okay. And a debugger, the debugger of a microcontroller is considered considered a peripheral. So you can step, th step through software lines of code um, in order to troubleshoot your code. Okay, so these, these peripherals and digital ports are common to pretty much every microcontroller, whether it's Atmel or a TI microcontroller or a microchip PIC, you can usually find these peripherals. Okay. Uh, so it's connecting, let's talk about connecting the ports and peripherals of the microcontroller IC um, or connecting to or from those. The development board headers provide access to the pins and the pins provide access to the internal ports and peripherals. So what you'll see in a data sheet is this, you'll see the, the chip, You'll see all these labels associated with each of the chip's pins. And you'll notice there's a lot going on here. Like PB6 has also T oscillator one and X crystal oscillator one and, and uh, port C interrupt six, right? There's a lot going on. Some pins, oftentimes all the pins that are usable are shared because there are more peripheral connections than there are pins. So when you have a lot of peripherals, a lot of capability and limited space and few pins, you have to share the pins. So that means you have to configure the pins in software. So pins are configurable in software. You know, for example, you have to define when you're using this Arduino's chip, whether you want pin 23 to be a digital port, PC0, 
or an analog to digital converter, number zero, or uh, an interrupt. Okay, so, so there takes some configuration up front when you're using a microcontroller. Let's take a look at the, the schematic and let me point some things out. So um, let's see down, where is the microcontroller? The microcontroller here is right over here. Okay, so you can see your analog to digital inputs here, right? And you can see all your pins with your port um, uh, designators here. But basically, let's see here, let me make sure I'm getting, yeah, that's the 28 pin chip there. Um, so what I wanna point out is when you have a microcontroller that is, wait, is that U3? Sorry, I'm trying to figure out which one is which here. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Uh, there, the reason this is confusing is because one of the chips is used for, for USB. In fact, it's the one on the left because this is the USB port here. This is the USB interface chip on the left. On the right is the microcontroller. But you should be able to see a few things here that look familiar. Um, for example, here's an op amp used as a comparator, right? Um, what else? Lots of capacitors in here that are used for either filtering or coupling. Here's an LED. There's a resistor in series with an LED to limit the current, just like you're doing in lab. Um, what else is going on here? You can see the node voltage is called out. Here's plus five volts, plus five volts. Right? You can see the grounds. Here's the, here are the grounds as a reference. Um, what else is on here that would be of interest? Um, another LED, but but you could start tracing through schematics like this from what you have in class and kind of figure out, well, this comparator up here in the upper left, this must be comparing two voltages. And it is, it's comparing uh, the V in, right? Here's a voltage divider. It's dividing down, dividing by two, that V in voltage so that it can be sensed by this comparator, comparing it to a reference of 3.3 volts, right? And that output is gonna control this transistor. This is a, a MOSFET here. It's going to control this transistor uh, to control the USB v uh, voltage, whether it's going to apply that voltage to this chip or not, right? So lots of stuff going on here, but you can start tracing through from what you learned in this class. Anyway, I have hit the wall on time, so I'm going to end here and then move on to the remaining material during the, the, the next lecture. Um, so don't forget the first session of lab is this week. So take a look at the assignment on Canvas because there is no pre-lab, but the lab assignment is out there. Take a look at that assignment. Uh, thanks for joining class. If you would like to chat during office hours, then just stick around on this Zoom session. If you don't want to chat, I'll see you next time. Have a great night.